Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. I'm your proprietor, Tony Ortega. And wow, this week, what a treat. Steve Kinane is joining me from London. How are you, Steve? Oh, I'm great, Tony. Really good to talk to you again. And uh, I'm in Tel Aviv, so hopefully we've figured out the technical part of this. I hope it sounds okay. Um, well, listen, I've uh, always been keeping an eye on your, your various legal things going on. I guess there's a small legal update, but that, that was just an excuse. I just wanted to see how you're doing. Oh, I'm going great, Tony. I've got a day off work, and um, I can't think of a better thing than to be talking to you while I kick back and um, not work. <laughs> well, speaking of work, uh, how I first encountered you, I think, was it the Valeska Paris story? I think it might have been. It was certainly around that time, which is 2011, and you were writing about Scientology for the Village Voice, and I'd put out a series of stories that year that you picked up on and um, added value to, and um, and so we started to get to know each other back then. And I, you definitely wrote about Valeska because I remember us comparing notes about her case and that you took it further. Um, and so, yeah, that was a, that's 12 years ago. Um, and, uh, I was the first person to talk to Valeska, um, on the record, I, I from memory. And it was an interesting case cause she was married to Chris Guider, who was a professional rugby league player in Australia. It's a form of football, a bit like rugby union. Um, and I, it was a big deal, him coming out and speaking and he spoke about Miscavige's violence and toxicity. And Valeska came along and I recorded an interview with Valeska at the same time, but we actually sat on it for a while because my editor at the time wasn't so keen on her story. He was very keen on um, Chris Guider's story. And so we made a big splash with that and kind of hung on to Valeska's story. And then I went back to my boss and said, come on, this is pretty good. This is somebody essentially accusing um, the Church of Scientology of human trafficking, um, and and that that um, behaviour and those orders went to the top. Um, and so, I, I think at the time, perhaps my editor was thinking enough with the Scientology stories, and I just needed a bit of breathing space. And then, of course, when I pulled it together, he was very happy. And it was it was a I think it was a really important story and um, and interesting uh, that it's become such a big story once again with right. the whole issue around serving miscavige where you know he pretends he doesn't you know have an address right. apparently is that, is that is that what he's saying i haven't been following it as closely as you but um... we'll, we'll get into that in a second i just i want to make sure people understand that see the chris guider story was bigger in australia because he was a sports figure there but not here but his story is fascinating i remember when you did that one of the things i, I thought was really interesting was the way that you got into how not only was Chris um, this sports figure who had been brought into Scientology, but he talked about how he was used to then get other athletes in, right? That's right. Um, and it all goes back to L. Ron Hubbard and, and the find your ruin thing. And it, right. it goes back to another professional athlete before Chris, a guy called Joe Reish, who I know you've spoken to as well, right. who was playing rugby league in Sydney at the highest level. Um, so imagine, imagine in the U S for example, like a pro, pro American football, this is the kind of level we're talking about. Yeah. And, and Joe had a groin injury back in the age of, you know, the late 1970s when sports science was not what it was five, 10, 20 years later. And he was looking for a way to fix this groin injury. And he was standing, um, um, at the, uh, at the, bus stop at Central Station in Sydney. And, you know, one of those people, young women with a clipboard went up to him and started asking him questions. And they found his ruin. It was the groin injury. And so they got Joe in and then Joe ended up helping to get Chris in. And Chris, um, you know, his whole club became a place where they were trying to recruit people. They recruited another guy called Pat Jarvis from that club. He played rugby league for Australia. So he was a seriously good player and he's still in Scientology. He wouldn't wow. talk to me for my book. Um, so yeah, it was a fascinating thing and it's, it, it's very much to me, a very real parallel with actors, you know, because yeah. they have vulnerabilities, you know, they, there's only a certain amount of 
positions on a football team, just as there's only a certain amount of, you know, roles in a movie. And there's all these people competing and they're all looking for that advantage. And Scientology will sell that to them and get them in a, you know, a vulnerable state. And this was also an era before player agents. So you didn't really have player agents running interference on these professional and semi-professional players and advising them in getting involved in cults, advising them against that. So it was a little interesting window. And um, yeah, so Chris's story was fascinating. And, um, and, and also, once again, um, it involved the RPF and how both Chris and Valeska were sent to Australia. Miscavige was essentially treating Australia like the old penal colony that it once was and yeah. dumping people as far away as possible. People who he considered to be a problem, sending them a long way away. And, you know, Mike, Mike Rinder wrote about this in his book, which I read a few months ago, which I loved. And I'm so glad he finally wrote that book. And there was some really, you know, interesting insights in there. But he talked about he was how he was threatened to be sent to, you know, not just Australia, but <laughs> Western Australia, which is even more isolated. So, um, yeah, it had a lot to it, that story. And I'm not surprised... Um, that Valeska hasn't let it go. Well, uh, it, it's interesting to me also that Scientology did have some success with athletes in Australia because I'm asked about that every once in a while. You know, why don't has Scientology tried to get in athletes in the U.S. and they have with very limited success. They've had a few, but for some reason in Australia they had a pretty good run there for a while. And uh, just to t just to bring it back to some cases we're still looking at today, Joe Raish is interesting, not just because of, of the, I know he did a real major piece for you there in Australia, but he ended up marrying Carol Masterson, yeah, who had a couple of young children, Danny and Chris Masterson. And Joe Raish was Danny Masterson's stepfather for some crucial years in his development. I mean, he was still a young kid. And Joe was very much uh, his parent. And uh, Joe and Carol then had two kids of their own, uh, Jordan and Alana Masterson, who once Joe had decided to leave Scientology, they just turned their backs on him completely. And yeah. this was one of those bizarre things for me in the court case in October was to see Danny Masterson on trial for allegedly raping three women and in the family section, here's Jordan and Alana. And I thought, you know, there's no more better example of what Scientology is about than right there, that these two adult TV actors will have nothing to do with their actual father, Joe Raish. But anyway, I'm sorry. It just It's interesting the way stories that you first covered um, are still sort of unfolding today, 20 years later. Yeah. It, and whenever I hear those stories of disconnection, it's just heartbreaking. And that's actually one of the reasons I started to do stories on Scientology was I, I don't I don't care what Scientologists believe in. What I cared about was the abuses right. of power and any right. journalist worth their salt. That's what they care about is the abuse of power. You should always be. And I was so glad to hear you talking to Mark Ebner and him talking about the work that he's continuing to do. Um, and, and exposing abuses of power and and how people, you know, get not only ripped off, but in in the case of Scientology, become victims of human trafficking or have child sex abuse covered up, or they're told they're to, to, told to lie to police about it, or right. they um, can never see their family again. Um, it's the abuse of power that always interested interested me, and um, and I, I just think that's why. So many journalists get their teeth into Scientology and don't let go because they can see the pain that it causes and continues to cause. Wasn't that another one of yours, the story about the young woman who came forward and said she had been told a lie about her stepfather's abuse? That's right. Yeah, that's right. That was Carmen. And um, between the ages of 8 and 11, her stepfather sexually abused her and um she told me that um, she was um, coached by Jan Eastgate, who um, was, the, was the head of the CCHR at the time internationally. Haven't heard much from her since my story went out, by the way, about no, 10 years no, ago. She's, right. she's been very silent. Um, 
I don't know where she is. Now she denied these allegations at the time, um, but um, Carmen said that she was coached to lie to police and community services about the abuse. Um, and she was also told, she pulled it in, the idea that it's your fault if something bad happened to you. Now the idea that you would tell an 11 year old girl that it was her fault that she'd been sexually abused. Is there anything worse than that than you could imagine? No. Um, and, and the trauma that that would cause you and not only the abuse, but not, you know, not being properly listened to and then being told to participate in something that is to keep Scientology in good standing. And it was around about that time, Tony, that somebody gave me a copy of introduction to ethics and it really informed my reporting on scientology where it shows you the internal justice system scientology where it's broken down into errors misdemeanors crimes and high crimes and everything you need to know about reporting on scientology is in them because all That's the great. high crimes all the high crimes so, so well sorry so many of the high crimes relate to uh not speaking out about scientology so there is a line and I can't remember it, but I'm, so I'm going off memory from about a decade ago, but one of the crimes was something like sexual relations with a minor or something like that, which we would call statutory rape. That is a crime. It's not a high crime, but testifying against, you know, Scientology in a public inquiry is a high crime. Yeah. So in other words, you would cover up abuse. Um, there's a, a built in incentive to cover up, cover up abuse. And, you know, you could be sent to the RPF or something like that, to their rehabilitation project force, to their re-education camp. If you told the truth to police or to community services or to a public inquiry or to a court. So I just think that that says it all about Scientology is that their internal legal system prioritizes the good standing of Scientology above all these other things. And it's not just in black and white in this book that you and I have a copy of and that has come up in the court cases that I've been covering, but it's that every single person who comes out of Scientology will tell you that same thing and say, listen, I was taught I cannot turn in a fellow Scientologist to the police. I mean, it's not just, you know, we have so many testimonies to that. There's just simply no doubt. And it's funny the way, you know, their spokeswoman, Corinne Powell, just daily during the trial would say, nope, that's not our rule. Nope, that's not true. And you just did look she, at her like... Did she testify? Because I was wondering if she was, you know, still she was a not, real person. She did not testify, but, you know, there would be shocking testimony in court. And then the reporters would all ask Scientology for a comment. And then Corinne Powell would just daily put out these statements. Nope, that's not true. That's not one of our rules. And, yeah. you know, these are reporters who are literally looking at the book. Yeah. And and I think you, earlier you sent me something, and I, I think it's spot on, is what you learn from this book is that, and I think all of us who report on Scientology learn this pretty quickly, you simply cannot trust a single thing that the Church of Scientology says about itself. Not a single no. thing. No, you you can't. And what happens is if they told the truth, they'd be punished. So there's right. there's these built-in incentives in there. And, and also they are, so if I can use that word brainwashed, I mean, other people use the word brain, mind control. It's probably more appropriate, but they are so controlled that they're taught that they are clearing the planet, making the world a better place as well. Um, so it's not just the incentives they are working. They're in, they're in a cult and they're all telling each other that we have to do these things to make the world a better place. And so it's not just the built in legal incentives. It's the propaganda that is reinforced on a daily basis to them that they right. must behave in this way. Yeah, it's incredible. So you, you had done the Joe Rache story, Chris Guider story, Carmen Rayner story. But yeah, your story on Valeska is what really caught my eye at the time. Um, and, you know, you had reported that this woman was basically a prisoner on the free winds for like a decade. 
That's right. And that once again, it relates to to speaking out because her um, her mother had gone on French television right. um, and, and spoken out about Scientology because uh, the allegation at the time was that Valeska's father was a self-made millionaire and that um, he lost all his money to Scientology. It's a familiar story that they once they get their hooks onto somebody with a bit of money, they they fleece them. And um, so he died pretty much penniless and he blamed Scientology. Valeska's mother spoke out um, on television and Valeska's mom, I think, was going to Florida at a certain point. And I think there was probably a fear that they would get Valeska out of the Sea Org. She, the mother would get the Valeska out of the Sea Org. And so they put Valeska on the free winds and they said they told her this is Valeska's story that she was going there for a couple of weeks. But she stayed for years. I think it might have even been 12 years. Um, mm -hmm. And I think at the time she said something like that she couldn't leave without an escort for the first six years. And she was only 18 when she was sent there. And she told horrendous stories, which are not in isolation. They're backed up by many other people of, you know, doing hard labor in the engine room. She talked about waking up one time and, and one of her colleagues thought she'd been unconscious and she for four hours and they don't know what why she was on the floor um it, it just sounded like a horrible environment and of course if you look at scientology's pr and their propaganda you know this is the where, the place that tom cruise has his birthday parties and right. you know, they do operating Phaeton level eight while cruising the caribbean but it's uh it's a horrible place um and people were sent there to get rid of them and then i even heard, came across stories of other people who were sent from the free winds in my book, I talked to a Venezuelan guy called um, Jose who fell in love with a young woman on board and they forbid that relationship. And, and um, so to get him away from her, they sent him to Australia. And Jose was the guy who ended up escaping from the RPF and was eating grass in a park in Sydney because he had no money uh, to buy any food. And he'd had to fight his way. He escaped from the RPF and then, um, see all heavyweights came to get him and he had to fight them off in the street. Um, so, you know, there's a, been a lot of misery in the free winds and um, it'll be very interesting to see what ends up happening in this case. And I haven't been following it really, but, um, you know, there's some horrific uh, abuses have gone on there over the years. And, um, you know, it's important that these stories come out. Did you ever get a chance to talk to Gawain and Laura Baxter? No, I didn't. I didn't. So I think I'd probably left Australia by the time they launched their legal proceedings. Yeah. And just before I left, I was also working on other stories. So I haven't really reported on Scientology for a long time, but I was, I was aware um, that they had taken this action and I certainly will, you know, watch with interest as what as what unfolds and let's face it there hasn't been a great track record on either getting miscavige in court or getting justice of of people speaking out against scientology in the in the in the legal system it's uh i mean it's an amazing lawsuit there's the valeska and the baxters have hooked up with some really good attorneys uh neil glazer had taken on nexium before and you can just see in their filings, these people are on the ball. They obviously care greatly about Valeska and the Baxters. And they've detailed some horrendous abuse on the free winds. But, you know, it's this American court thing that uh, Scientology rushes into court and says, oh, wait a minute, they signed these contracts. They're not supposed to sue us. They have to take this to our own version of religious arbitration. So a little kangaroo court where Scientologists in good standing are, are the arbitrators. It's just ludicrous. And these American judges um, take it seriously. So, you know, we're waiting for a ruling that uh, that's supposed to come uh, before too long. But it's just amazing that Scientology has a pretty good track record of derailing lawsuits that way. I don't know if it's any better in Australia. Um, look, every legal system in the Western world that I know of favors the rich. And if you can throw money at it and delay and, you know, 
obfuscate and whatever, it, it always advantages people who can pay the lawyers. It's just the way it is. Um, I, I, it staggers me that they, you know, would they do that with the Catholic Church? If you had people who are victims of abuse of priests, would you then send them off to religious arbitration in, in, the, in, the, in the institution that facilitated that abuse or, you know, protected the abuser? What, would that happen? I don't think it would. What the hell are they doing? Why are they sending people off back to Scientology? These people are speaking out about the abuse in that organisation. I cannot believe that judges continue to do that. I know. Um, it's insane. It's insane. Well, you, you go, went into a very deep dive on the history of Scientology generally and, and in your book, which I know was more focused on Scientology in Australia. Um, brilliant book. And, and, and oh, I, the, uh, I guess the, the part about Jose eating grass, that's how you start. Isn't that how you start the book? That's right. I start, and I started that the book in that way, because number one, Jose's story had never been told. Right. And secondly, to me, it made sure that I was focusing everyone's attention on the abuse, the abuse of power. Um, the fact that, you know, Jose, Jose got a visa in Australia based on the fact that he was a victim of human trafficking. That tells us that the Church of Scientology engages in human trafficking. And that organization continues to get tax-free status in Australia. And how can you not be angry about that? How can you not be angry about the fact that an organization that engages in human trafficking is essentially being subsidized by the taxpayer to engage in the practices that it engages in? And not just human trafficking, but forcing women to have abortions, um, forcing people to disconnect from their loved ones, um, forcing labor practices on um, individuals in the sea organization that are beyond what any um, proper person would consider to be a fair working um, employment situation. So it was very important to me to ground that book in that story about a story of one individual and the harm that they had caused that individual. And, um, and so, yeah, that's how I started the book. But then I wanted to go back to the history. And yes, it was, it did have a very Australian bent to it. But I also wanted to tell the broader story about um, Hubbard, about his war record, about what he believed, about how it started off not as a religion and, that, and how often they talked about it not being a religion. Hubbard talking about it not being a religion, it being in the memos of the day. And I found memos from the 1960s in the archives in Victoria, where there's the local, um, what they called the Hubbard Association of Scientologists International. It was like a franchise, essentially. And one of the biggest ones in the world in Melbourne, um, that they weren't a religion. They were very clear about that, but then they cloaked it uh, as a religion to protect it and to get, you know, help get tax-free status and all the, and the likes of it and protect it against raids from um, government agencies. So, yeah, I started with that story, but I really wanted to go through the history. And, you know, that took me to the US and it took me to the UK um, because, you know, that's where the free wind starts because Hubbard's in trouble in the UK. Um, you know, and when I said, sorry, when I, you know, when I say that's where the free wind starts, well, that's where um, the Sea Org really starts because um, Hubbard has to leave the UK. So I wanted to tell the story um, both of Australia, but also Scientology's uh, origins and its evolution and to try and intertwine it with certain characters and some characters who'd never told their stories before, um, like the Gillum siblings. Um, so it was quite a ride. It took me four years to write it. And um, I'm really glad I did it. Uh, I'm still defending the book in court, not by oh. the, the Scientologists never sued me. And I, I can't really go into big details about it. It was um uh, a pair of doctors sued me because I wrote a, a chapter in that book about the only decent thing the Church of Scientology ever really did in Australia was expose um, medical malpractices at a certain hospital in, in Sydney and they put a nurse in undercover who um, took the medical records and that led to a state inquiry, et cetera, et cetera. So I ended up getting into um, protracted litigation 
um, with the doctors. It's still ongoing, so I can't really talk about it. Um, I'm facing a retrial in July. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it was just, yeah, it was a, quite a ride. And I uncovered stuff I never would have thought of, I would uncover. And I spoke to people that I never thought I would speak to. And um, I'm really glad I did it because, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else <laughs> would have done it, Tony. You know, that, th wow. that feeling where you go, I've got to do this because no one else is mad enough to do it. That's kind of the feeling <laughs> I had when I started well, let's, writing. Well, let's make sure we say the title. It's fair game. Make sure you pick up a copy if you haven't. The, one of the things that impressed me so much about it was, um, you know, we kind of take it for granted today that Scientology is this very litigious uh, organization that thinks of everyone else as enemies and has all these really draconian policies as a very paranoid organization. And what you did was you helped explain how much Australia actually had to do with that Scientology becoming that kind of an organization. That when, the, when Australia tried to crack down on some of Scientology's worst practices, L. Ron Hubbard freaked out and as a result made his organization more draconian, more punitive, more paranoid. And that Australia is very much at the center of that. And if you want to understand why Scientology is the way it is today, you need to consider that history. I found that really impressive. And I didn't really understand that until I joined the dots and went through the inquiry and saw the policies that came out from Hubbard afterwards, which essentially led to the Guardian's office, which led to spying on public figures, um, yep. you know, that it, le it led to ethics, it led to all of those kind of things, it, you know, because it right. led, you, you, you have, uh, yeah, just to go back, you know, you had all these Australians leave, uh, Australian Scientologists leave the country and go to St. Hill Manor in the 60s because Scientology ended up being banned in Melbourne, sorry, in Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia, three states. And so they go to St. Hill Manor where Hubbard is in London, oh, sorry, outside of London, south of London in East Sussex. And that rejuvenates St. Hill Manor. But what ends up happening is an Australian journalist called Alex Mitchell takes a copy of the Anderson Inquiry report, which led to the ban, and he hands it around to Fleet Street journalists. And so whenever Scientology pops up, um, they quote from this Anderson inquiry saying Scientology is evil and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so that has an influence on the British politicians. And that leads to um, Hubbard having to flee the UK. And look, Hubbard talks about um, setting up the Sea Org and um, going around the Mediterranean as some kind of voyage of discovery. Essentially, he was on the run. You know, he was leaving the UK because they were going to crack down. They were cracking down on him already about the amount of Scientologists who could come into the country. And, you know, the game was up for, for him in the UK. So that's why um, the Sea Org starts. And, yeah, all of this can be, you know, that could, goes back to um, that inquiry in Australia and the influence that had. And, you know, Hubbard very much saw that as some kind of conspiracy involving psychiatrists, you know, merchants right. of chaos like you and me, Tony, the journalists, um, um, <laughs> the, the global world order who were ganging up on him. And so that's, you know, a lot of these harsh policies come from that inquiry, coming from the paranoia that he thinks there is a cabal of people out to get him. Um, and of course, some of that goes back to him getting a few bad book reviews from the, the medical establishment in the 1950s as well, which is, you know, you and I know that's why Tom Cruise um, these days or, you know, in past days has been very critical of the pharmaceutical industry and the, um, and the psychiatrist. It all goes back to a few book, bad book reviews in the 1950s. Um, they're a sensitive bunch, aren't they? Well, Hubbard was such a sensitive man. <laughs> very... <laughs> who, who hasn't had a bad book review, Tony, really? Do you then, start, do you then blame a whole industry for it and want to want, yeah. want them tracked down and, and want, private investigators put on them that's the biggest overreach to a bad book review i've ever heard <laughs> well uh 
you touched lightly on your book's uh, legal situation. And I, the only thing I want to point out, if it's okay with you, um, is the, the basic problem is that when you had, first of all, Steve, what were you doing giving Scientology credit for something? There's, that's your first mistake, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, in that chapter, um, you were relying on a government inquiry, a royal inquiry. Yeah. Uh, now, now, in this country, in the United States, if, um, for example, the, 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 the case that Valeska is going through right now, we'll talk about it a little bit more, um, you know, that's a federal lawsuit taking place in Tampa, Florida, and both sides are submitting documents that are pretty amazing and fun to read. And as a journalist, I can take those documents and quote from them freely. They are privileged documents. They are in a court case. And even if they include allegations of wrongdoing, uh, as a journalist, I'm protected because I'm quoting from an official government document, or not a government document, but a document that's in a government file. And in the United States, we just we have the First Amendment to our Constitution, which guarantees the press of uh, that freedom. And uh, as a journalist, I you know I have certain rules I have to follow. I can't just throw out allegations of wrongdoing by people that I've heard people talk about. But if it's in a document in a government file, then I can do that. Now, in Australia, that's essentially what you had been doing was there was this government file, this government inquiry, royal inquiry, into this situation that we won't go into. But basically, they had certain findings after gathering facts. And sure, this was 30 years ago, but uh, you know, this was an official government uh, thing that you quoted from. But in Australia, there is not that protection. And so my understanding was that when this lawsuit was filed, the judge, in the initial judge said, okay, yeah, even though this is coming from a government inquiry that happened 30 years ago, this reporter is going to have to prove all over again that those things happened in that way, which is just absolutely insane to me that uh, you would be put into that position. And that was what you had to do in that law, in that trial, right? Yeah, I should also add that I, in that chapter, also had information that was beyond that inquiry that I had okay. gathered myself as well. But essentially what I did was rely on the findings of that Royal Commission. Um, I can't talk too much more about it, except to say that Australia has... We don't have constitutional protections of free speech like you do in the US. Um, we've also had a defamation system um, that has been in, in need of reform because it gives too much, um, I, you know, of course, I'm going to say this, I'm a journalist, but I think it um, doesn't give enough protection to journalists. And all I can say is that I know from legal experts I've spoken to and journalists who just said my case would not got past first base in the US or the UK or Europe. Um, and the UK is a country at the moment where, you know, for years, um, Russian oligarchs have been able to use the system here or even um, we've seen um, the head of the Wagner Group, Prigozhin, using the British um, legal system um, to intimidate journalists. So, you know, the British system is better than the Australian system, and that's open up open to abuses. Uh, there have been changes in defamation law in Australia, um, not in time for my case, but we just have to wait and see how we go with the retrial later um, in the year. Um, but yes, um, it, it those laws in Australia historically have made it difficult for uh, reporters to do the kind of stories that do take on people who are rich and powerful. Um, and hey, that's important for a democracy that we're able to scrutinize um, people with power, people with money. Um, so, you know. But also, the, not just journalists, I, I just, uh, I was looking on that, you had sent me a link for a, a piece you did, and I actually saw something uh, on the same screen. And so I looked at it. 
and it was talking to this journalist Peter Grest, who apparently is, yeah. this is his his big issue, and he was explaining not not only are Australian journalists exposed, but that the people they talk to, so like whistleblowers, people that risk their lives and careers getting information out to journalists can be exposed in Australia in a way that doesn't happen in other countries. And that just shocks me. Absolutely. And um, whistleblower protections in the US <coughs> are, um, are far better. And there has been a, an awful history in Australia in the last 10 years of whistleblowers being targeted. I mean, whist whistleblowers' lives are already difficult enough. Um, you know, often their relationships break down, they find it hard to get work, but to then not be protected by the law just makes it even worse. And it prevents people from coming forward and exposing the truth. Um, I mean, look, hey, on, on the issue at the moment, for all the free speech protections in the US, the US is trying to extradite Julian Assange and charge him under espionage and prosecute him for publishing um, top secret information, the same information that was released by Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning is free. So, <laughs> so you, all governments in their own way find a way of trying to make sure that nobody exposes information. But in the US, you have those fundamental protections in a way that you don't have in Australia. And it's far more healthy, far more healthy that we have a you know, systems in place that protect journalists, protect whistleblowers. Um, and transparency is so important for a democracy. I mean, at the moment, we are we are seeing what happens in, in, in vivid colour in a country like Russia, where you can be locked up for protesting, you know, and thrown in jail for 15 years. You know, people like yeah. Vladimir Karamurza, the opposition politician, um, is facing treason charges. He could be in jail for 20 years. Um, these are values in Western democracies that we are meant to hold dear of, um, of truth and not being afraid to expose our, our, our dirty linen when, you know, when government fails, when business fails, when unions fail, where there's corruption, where there's abuse. Um, and um, it's really important that, you know, there's a lot of Western democracies talking at the moment about values and it's really important that we have our houses in order at home on issues around free speech um on on whistleblowers on all of these kind of issues because these are the societies we want to live in and this is the kind of society that the ukrainians are fighting for right now of you know an open democracy and it's so important that the other Western democracies are a shining light to the other um, countries and show what it is like to have an open, transparent uh, country that is not afraid to confront um, the dark side of what happens in any society and that those things are exposed by journalists. And in an age when, you know, when, when newspaper revenues are down and there's less, you know, there's not in the investigation teams that used to be on the big newspapers, you know, it's a bit different for, you know, some of them like yeah. the New York Times that have, you know, come up with a subscription model that works. Um, but yeah, it's really important that Western democracies have their houses in order on this front, I reckon. Well, and I want to get to Ukraine in a second, but I, before I forget, I just want to point out that even with the situation with journalistic rights in Australia, it sure seems often from the point of view over here in the U.S. that the Australian press is still very aggressive with Scientology. And the work that you do and Ben Schneider's and Brian Seymour has just been terrific, even with those limitations. So, I, you know, you must have some, you know, bosses with that have at least are some bravery out over there because it seems like um, Scientology has really... Uh, been exposed in Australia time and time again. That's true. We have had some good editors. And um, and I know this is something you spoke to Mark about, is that the influence that that, um, when Richard Baha wrote that great piece in Time magazine and that legal case that um, they sued for $400 million and, and it dragged on for 10 years, that definitely had a chilling effect um, all around the world. And I just think that editors lost their backbones a bit in relation to that. 
And there were some notable exceptions in the US, obviously. I mean, people like yourself and Mark Ebner and um, Tobin and Charles did great work. Um, I feel like in the US that it was the TV networks who went the preemptive buckle way too early, way too early. And the thing that they used to do is, um, you know, Scientology always had this thing of, didn't they, of printing out a big list of affidavits of people who signed them and said, well, that never happened, you know. Right, David, right. Miscavige, David Miscavige didn't ha hit that person. I was in the room. And I remember when I did the Chris Guider story, um, they sent me an affidavit of a guy, I think his name was Gary Vesey, who said that didn't happen, that never happened, blah, blah, blah. And I never spoke to this guy. I got these affidavits sent to me by the communications unit of Scientology in California. So I rung up, rung them up and said, can I speak to Gary VC? And they wouldn't put me through because I wanted to test his claims. I wanted to even see if he was the guy who signed that affidavit. I didn't know. Right. I, didn't, right. I, didn't see, I didn't see him sign the affidavit. Um, and the thing that, and they said it was inappropriate. The Church of Scientology said it was inappropriate that I rung um, their organization and asked to speak to him. Um, and the, <laughs> what a joke. What, why is it inappropriate that I try and test his claims and see if he actually signed the affidavit in the first place? Now, right. all the people that I ever spoke to who exposed Scientology, these so-called apostates, and, you know, like this, Scientology, I think, they, that's the other thing to remember about them, is, is they never admit that they got it wrong. They never admit that somebody abused somebody you know even the catholic church has done that over the years um i mean the the worst thing they say will is for example in you know i think paul at cooper's case don't they say that there was a rogue unit involved or something <laughs> you know that, you know that's <laughs> that's the most that they will ever say they don't actually say oh we did we were wrong um right. but i i just think that um the people who i spoke to the whistleblowers the people who've been in scientology they, were, they always made themselves available for the hard questions, for me to yeah. test their allegations. Yeah. The Church yeah. of Scientology never does this. Miscavige does that one interview with Ted Koppel years ago. I mean, what is he afraid of? We all know what he's afraid of. He's afraid of being exposed. He doesn't have the guts to do interviews, and they don't put people up anymore for proper interviews. They have Karen Powell releasing these statements. Um, well, supposedly i'm not seeing her anywhere um they go out under her name is it really karen powell i don't know um and so I, when i would ring up and ask to to talk to these people they wouldn't put me through and i was lucky that my editors went well we'll run what they say um and we won't be intimidated by a pile of affidavits as if that's somehow proof that this never happened right um so I just think it's always really, really important that um, the, the reporters don't get snowed by the Church of Scientology. And that's another thing that you and Mark talked about was the importance of the body of work that people have done, and particularly people like yourselves, that reporters who come in fresh and start looking at this, you know, fact that all this stuff's online now that you can go and reference, you know, all of these different cases involving Scientology, you can reference their policies. You have an understanding of the intimidatory tactics that they use. It's so critical um, to reporting because most reporters do not have their time, that the time to get their head around even the language of Scientology, let alone the policies of Scientology. Um, so having that body of work out on the internet has been so important, I think, to exposing Scientology. And um, it's a real credit to the people who did it in the years when it was really tough. And when I started doing it from about 2010 to 2011, um, it was, it was you know, like they were threatening to sue me all the time, but it wasn't like the harassment campaigns that people like Paulette Cooper had to put up with. It was nothing like that. And I'd have to say it was easier in Australia too, because they simply did not have the foot soldiers um, to really you know, mount a 24 seven surveillance kind of, you know, they probably could have employed private investigators, but we weren't, we wouldn't have been exposed to the kind of harassment um, that American reporters would be under as well. So that probably made it easier for us too, I would argue. Well, I'm sure they, you know, they tried to make it difficult on you and you make such a good point about those affidavits. Uh, they're still whipping those out. 
and um, they just get stuck online or, you know, the uh, people that the reporters just say, well, Scientology sent us this, you know, and it's important to question them. I'm glad you tried anyway. So you, when you were doing those stories, that was for ABC in, in Australia? Yeah. Who are, you, who are you with now? To bring us up to date now. What's been going on with you? So I still work for the ABC. Um, so that was back in 2010, 2011, I was doing those stories. And then I wrote the book and that came out in 2017. And, um, and that took me four years to write. And I'm still working for ABC. So ABC is the public broadcaster in Australia. It's like the Australian version of the BBC. Um, and so I'm now working in their bureau, in their Europe bureau. So I cover all of Europe. Um, so I work as a correspondent. Um, and it's a busy time over here. Um, you know, the war in Ukraine has dominated what we've been covering. Um, you know, you, in my job, you cover elections in Europe. You cover all kinds of stories. But um, the war which has now been going on for a year, has dominated our coverage. So our correspondents have been going in and out of Ukraine um, and also doing our best to cover the region and all the implications for having a, a large scale war in Europe um, and the implications for NATO and and implications for Baltic states and, and you know, you know, countries that border with Russia and border with Ukraine and the refugee crisis that's come and the the grain crisis that's come as a result of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So we've been very, very busy covering all of that, but also we cover elections in Europe and other different stories. So it's it's very different to what I was doing. I was working in more of an uh, investigations kind of role and now I'm doing more, you know, daily reporting. But it's a great job and it's very stimulating um, and, I, and I love it. Well, but you have done some investigative pieces. I mean, you sent me a link to about a half hour show you did about Eastern Ukraine and the uh, what people, what they've been going through there, what it's been like when uh, Russia had occupied that area for a while, but then were pushed back. And I have to say, man, uh, you look like you were right on the front lines. I was a little afraid for you. I hope you're taking some precautions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, I was, and I wasn't, I was on certain days. So there was a time where I was in a place called Kupiansk very briefly. And that was certainly within a couple of kilometers of the front line. And you could tell the soldiers didn't really want us there for very long. They were, they, we wanted to talk to them and talk because this was at the end of last year, they had what they called the Kharkiv counteroffensive, which was possibly the greatest counteroffensive in modern warfare since World War II, where they took all this land that had been occupied by the Russians in Eastern Ukraine off them and pushed them back. And it was quite an extraordinary um, month. I think they uh, got about 10,000 square kilometers back off the Russians. And so we wanted to talk to soldiers who'd been involved in that um, um, counteroffensive. So to do that, we had to go where they were, which was really the front line. So we went and spoke to some of those people. And Tony, it was really moving talking to those people because um, it was moving talking to everyone I spoke to when I was there about what it was like to live under Russian occupation and what it was like to be liberated, but also to hear the soldiers talk about what they were fighting for. You know, one of the guys I spoke to said, you know, I've been to Europe and I've seen what it's like to be educated there. And I want my kids to grow up in a place like that. I don't want to be turning towards Russia. I want to be turning towards Europe. And they want democracy in that country. Um, and they don't want the old ways. They don't want the old ways of corruption that's also dogged that country. Um, and it was incredibly moving to hear these people, these, these, these soldiers um, who had just liberated these areas and spoke about what it was like too to have people coming out of their basements and and you know, kissing them and giving them flowers and what that was like. But also knowing that, yes, they've liberated that part of their country, but 18% of their country is still in, in Russian hands. Um, but I also spoke to, you know, people who'd been tortured. One man, a 70-year-old man who'd been taken away by Russian soldiers because he'd uploaded a video of Russian tanks onto his YouTube channel. And he was taken away and he was held and um, tortured across a period of 100 days. And just and you hearing found those, 
he story. Said that, he said he said that they wanted they were torturing him because they wanted him to make a pro Russian video, uh, and upload that to his YouTube, and he refused. Yep, incredible, incredible. So he was basically asked to make a, a Russian propaganda video, and he said, "I won't do it." He said that because you know, and they said. We will, we will, we will execute you if you do not record this video. And he said, "Well, if I essentially, he thought to himself, if I do that, and I am in, he was obviously believed in a in a god. And he said, if I was in heaven, I couldn't look my parents in the eye and tell them that I betrayed my country. You know, so he said no, and you know they didn't execute him, um, and." But they kept doing this. They kept going, well, you're going to do the video today. So the strength of character of these people who are standing up to the, the this kind of occupying force who are, you know, you know, the idea that you take in a 70-year-old man and torture him like that, it's just barbaric. And, and when you see that courage in the face of, you know, the threat of being executed and the threat of ongoing torture, it's quite something. Um, so to to go and to be in those areas of um, eastern Ukraine just after the liberation um, was quite something. It, you were a witness to history, but also really a witness to quite inspirational um, human reactions to the most extreme of circumstances. So to see those people and how they responded, I it was really quite inspiring. Yeah, well, it was a great, great video, a great piece that you did, and you ended you. up, you ended up at a kind of a party in a bunker, <laughs> a, lit, a literary event. I mean, that's... yeah, not your bunker. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bunker in Kharkiv, which is thirty kilometers from, or you know, twenty miles from um, the Russian border. Ukraine's second largest city and a city that's been virtually under constant fire during the war. Incredible people, once again, who resisted the Russian invasion and held that city. Uh, many of them civilians who just recently joined a kind of territorial defense, um, like a citizen's army, and they held that city. Quite incredible. And also being bombarded with missiles, being so close to the border uh, of Russia. And yeah, I ended up in a um, at a literary festival um, at a bunker bar, it was called the Kharkiv Literary Festival, and there was poetry and uh, theatre and music, and it was so inspiring to see these people, um, you know, basically saying, you know, we are resisting and we're resisting through art, and it's also a, a, a country that, and a, and a part of um, Ukraine where a lot of poets and intellectuals were killed by Stalin in the twenties and thirties. So they've been here before where they've seen their culture and their uh, and their people uh, attacked and they understand the concept of resistance. And this was an act of artistic resistance, holding this festival in the middle of a war zone in a bunker. Um, oh, amazing. amazing people. And I have to ask you uh, if you've spent any time in Kiev and did, did you run into Sweeney? <laughs> I've spent a bit of time there, but I haven't. Um, seen Sweeney there because, but I saw him. I've seen him a couple of times in London. I saw him just before I was going back to Ukraine, and he was in London, and we swapped notes about places to go. And um, of course, as journalists, the big question was, where can we go where the military won't stop us from going? <laughs> <laughs> so, the classic, the classic journalist question of what can we get away with? Where do we go? How do we get there? What do you, you know? So we compared notes about that, but I had when I first moved to London a while back. I it was before he, it was when he was working on his excellent book on Putin called Killer in the Kremlin, which I would recommend all listeners to go and get a copy of, all about Putin. And because Sweeney has been on Putin's case for twenty three years, he knew mm. from the beginning when you know people like George W. Bush. And Obama thought, you know, they could do resets or look into the eyes of his soul. Sweeney knew what Putin was like from the beginning and has been exposing him from that period of time. And when he was writing the book, I met him for a drink in London um, 
and he was with a whole bunch of young journalists um, who, you know, obviously liked hanging out with Sweeney and who wouldn't. Um, and and a few of them wanted to go and have a wanted to go and have a dance somewhere. So we were in Soho in London, and we went around the corner to this bar, and I still have this image of um, Sweeney on the dance floor with his backpack on. <laughs> <laughs> a journalist in his 60s, I think, dancing to a Fleetwood Mac song. I may be wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. He'll, he, you know, he'll take it out on me. But I took a photo of him and <laughs> it was a beautiful image because, of course, he had his backpack on because he's got a laptop in his backpack with a manuscript um, about Putin in his backpack and he doesn't want anyone getting their hands on that. Right. So. Sweeney has not changed. Um, and look, he has been, he's, I, I feel like he's been in the war for 80%. I've gone in and out a little bit, but not much. But he, he's in there all the time. And he was in there um, when Russia invaded. And you just can't help but respect the guy because he's been on Putin's case forever. And he's incredibly courageous. And um, he understands the importance about exposing what is going on there. And, um, you know, he's because he's traveling by himself, he's been able to get around to certain places that are, are harder to get into with a TV crew. So he was getting in, in and out of Bakhmut when the fighting was pretty hairy there early on. Um, so I haven't seen him in Ukraine, but with um, he's helped me out when I was going in. And um, yeah, he's uh, he's incredible. And I really recommend reading that book of his. Such a, such a great guy. And, and gosh, think back before Ukraine, before the pandemic, uh, there was that perfect afternoon in Perugia, Italy. It was, I believe, wasn't it his 60th birthday? Maybe? It was his 60th birthday. That's right. Yes. And he had a party on a rooftop there. And yeah. uh, I just happened to be vacationing in Italy and you just happened to be not too far away. And we all met there and got to have a, a drink on top of a rooftop. And uh, wow, that was what that was. It's amazing. It seems like a million years ago now, but um, it really wasn't. It was only a few years ago. I think but, that was five years ago. Yeah. Was it five years ago? It's so fun. So great to see him there. And wow, think about what he's been through since then. It's just incredible. Yeah, and he keeps going. And he, um, you know, he's got a podcast about Putin as well. He did a podcast about um, Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, he's unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll never forget when he said that he'd been assigned to North Korea and uh, covering Putin, but the. Uh, he said one of the most frightening things he ever did was covering the Church of Scientology. Yeah, it really puts it in, spec in perspective, doesn't it? He's he's been in and out of war zones for thirty years, um, but he's lost he, he lost his rag at the Scientologists in a way that he hasn't lost his calm in war zones. So it kind of shows you what they're capable of. Um, and you know, he was under intense pressure when he was filming that panorama for the BBC. And, um, of course he said, he said subsequently it's got him out of trouble pre uh, since, because when he's been <laughs> in authoritarian regimes where they question whether he's really a journalist, he's able to pull up him yelling at Tommy Davis, <laughs> um, and show that yes, he's TV's John Sweeney. So, um, <laughs> they did him all a favor. And of course that program was so widely watched around the world in part because of the promotional value of him losing it with Tommy Davis. Um, so yeah, classic case, isn't it? Where Scientology thinks that they're discrediting somebody, but they're actually getting more people to watch it. It's almost like the Streisand effect. Um, yeah, they do it all the time. Well, you've always kept your cool, Steve Kinane, <laughs> and, uh, You've gotten them on some great stories. Um, uh, and even though uh, you've got this little war you're, you're watching over there in Europe, uh, we miss you in the in the Scientology Wars. Oh, thank you, Tony. And, you know, much respect for, to you for all the fantastic work you've done over the years. And hopefully I can get to a howdy con sometime soon. <laughs> we can have another one. Maybe next year. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, good luck with that court case in July. And uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, my pleasure, Tony. Great to talk to you. Now I'm hunker down in bunker town again, again, again to witness history. Ride the storm. Wait to see how reckoning.